this, uh, his previous visit was a year or so ago. It was actually probably one of the highest attended uh, speakers' talks that we had. So I'm glad to see another full room here uh, today. He's going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, while the GFC uh, continues to uh, persist even about a half a decade later, and also show off some uh, cool macroeconomic modeling software that uh, he's in the process of de developing at the moment. So uh, without further ado, a big round of applause for Steve. <laughs> I'm going to get a bit of exercise here, tapping the keyboard while standing close to the screen. So here we go. Okay, uh, well, what I'm talking about is not just a crisis in the, in the economy, but a crisis in economic theory as well. Anybody here suffered through an economics degree of any, any sort? Okay. Did you know you were suffering at the time? <laughs> Good. Okay. I've just read, published a new edition of this book to point out why economic theory is so bad. I read the first one back in 2001, before the crisis. And uh, then I called the crisis in the beginning of late, late December 2005. And half, half of the way through, it's time for an update both of why the theory is wrong and the near conventional economic theory and why they didn't see the crisis coming. That, that's really the major way this book has been changed. Uh, an extra 90,000 words on, the, on basically on macroeconomics, where the first book effectively attacked neoclassical micro, and now looking at the macro side of things as well. And the intriguing thing is. Before the crisis happened, you couldn't have got a more triumphalist, uh, absolutely confident bunch of people than conventional economists. And this is the president of the uh, American Economic Association in 2003. Notice when he says macroeconomics was born in the 1940s. I would have thought the 1930s myself, but anyway. And he goes on to say that that was the knowledge we thought would prevent another economic disaster like the Great Depression. And he opens his speech. This is the annual meeting of the American Economic Association, 10,000 economists in the room. It's pretty close to right there. Normally, they put a whole lot in one hall when they give the speech. He's saying, we've succeeded. And how have we succeeded? The central problem of preventing depressions has been solved for all practical purposes for many decades. That's how confident they were in 2000, the end of 2003. And this is Ben Bernanke. You know that name? Not looking particularly happy these days, but back in 2004 he was cock a hoop. Because according to him and most conventional economists, the economy is now in a period they call the great moderation. A bit like Fukuyama's phrase, the end of history. And about as uh, prescient too. Saying it's all over now and nothing but stability and tranquility lies ahead. And he said we've got less frequent recessions, milder, lower volatility and output and employment. Uh, all these things have happened. And guess what? We can thank better monetary policy for causing it. Many, many views as to why it's happened, but uh, improved control of inflation, which is what the Federal Reserve is supposed to be responsible for, is always being responsible for the main cause of this quote unquote welcome change in the economy. That's how much warning these guys had the disaster was about to strike. And in the academic field as well, this is, I'm going from uh, back to academia now, this is the editor the founding editor for the American Economic Review of Macroeconomics. Oliver Blanchard, he was the chief economist of the IMF for a while, he's going back there again, I think. But right as he's writing, uh, as he was leaving the job of opening up this new journal on macroeconomics, he was saying that facts of, uh, there's a dispute between what they call freshwater and saltwater economists that's been going on for 20 or 30 years. Finally, the facts have managed to resolve it in favor of the saltwater crowd, which is Paul Krugman and friends like that. Um, a common vision has emerged. The state of macro is good. Now, notice the publication dates there, 2008, 2009. The first, the first post of this is a working paper, so it's his decision to put it up on the website, on August 13, 2008. And the date we now take as the beginning of the crisis is August 7, two, uh, August, uh, 7 2007. That's the day that the Bank National of the Paris BNP shut down three of its funds that were exposed to the subprime disaster in the States. So a year later, he was thinking macro was good. Still. Now, what actually happened was a rather rapid transition from the state they called the Great Moderation. This is a smooth data plot of the American information for uh, unemployment and the inflation rate. You can see cycles, but the cycles are diminishing in magnitude. And that's what they saw over a 20 year period. We started from 1980 here after about 2007. And then this happened. Bang. 
unemployment goes through the roof, inflation becomes deflation, and the black line I'm now plotting there is something they had ignored all the way through. That's the level of private debt compared to GDP. Now you can find plenty of economists in thought, including Paul Krugman, who today will reassure you there's absolutely nothing to worry about about the debt level. It has no impact on the economy. The fact that it turns around after the crisis begins is mere coincidence. I don't think. So that transition we are to now, with a bit of a recovery going on at the moment, that is something that is completely unexpected. Now beforehand, I'll show you the triumphalism of those early statements. What are they like after the event? Well, here is uh, Sargent, who's a, a companion of the Lucas that I've, this is a quote from the, from the presidential address I showed you earlier. Lucas and Sargent are research collaborators. And uh, Sargent, getting, just before getting the Nobel Prize in economics this, in 2011, did this thing to you where he said the models that didn't see the crisis coming were in fact designed for normal times, not for abnormal times. Therefore, you can't criticize them. But they didn't see the abnormal times coming. And here's Bernanke saying, well, standard models, are they flawed because they didn't see the crisis coming? No, I don't think so. Uh, most of the time they work during the good times. This is a bit like saying we've got a car which is really good on straight and flat roads but not particularly good at curves. Therefore, you can't blame it when it smashes into a corner. And here's Blanchard again, the guy from the AER, American Economic Review editor, saying that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, just because our models completely failed to predict the biggest economic event in the last 70 years, there's no reason to reject them. And when they're trying to explain the crisis now, all their models have, notice I'm saying they, I, I introduced myself socially as an anti-economist given my attitude to what has happened in my so-called profession in the last 40 years. But what they argue is that the economy is inherently stable and all the fluctuations we see are due to exogenous shocks. And you improve its stability by removing regulations and getting the government out of the way. That's the basic way they think. Well, along comes this huge crisis, and first of all, it happens. Well, that has to be a really big exogenous shock, you know, like a meteor from, from Mars bouncing off uh, northern, northern Florida and uh, bringing the economy down. But of course, exogenous shocks have a mean of zero. And if the exogenous shock, which is negative at some point, shouldn't there be a positive one at some stage? But the explanation they give for the crisis continuing is a really big exogenous shock that kept on happening and changed in magnitude over time. So they now think they can explain why the models didn't predict it by saying, well, it's a really big shock from the outside of the system, and the shock then got bigger and remained negative, which is just ridiculous. So the real basis of this crisis is not an exogenous shock. It's something endogenous, something in the system itself that causes crises, like when we're when, when now. And that thing which caused the crisis is the growth of private debt, and it didn't just cause the crisis, it also caused the preceding boom they call the Great Moderation. So the, the high, high rate of growth of private debt gave us an apparent boom between 1993 and 2007. The slowdown of that increase in debt, and now it's plunging, is what's called the Great Recession. And it will keep on going until the, the, the reduction in debt levels is over, which could take 10 to 15 years. That's the walk away. If anybody wants to go out now, that's the, uh, the summary of the, the final conclusions. But I'll take you through the the reasons why neoclassicals didn't see it coming. And it's because they, they don't analyze any of those factors in their model. They leave them out completely. But the key one that they've got that they admit is the question of money itself. Now, again, if you, those who did economics degrees would remember being taught the thing they call the money illusion. Remember that at all in first year? That's the argument that the amount of money, nominal money, doesn't matter. So you know, these folding things are unimportant. All they are is a veil over barter, as economists say, to simply make it easier for us to swap, you know, uh, Apple laptops for Cornetto bars. Okay, the money plays no, no essential role in the system, it's just a lubricant. <coughs> That's the idea they teach. Well, think about your own situation, your own personal situation. You've got two things you can spend out of. You can spend out of your income, or you can max out the credit card. Now, those two elements together are what determine your personal spending capacity. And my phone's going off, and I should have turned it up before I got here, shouldn't I? <laughs> That's a great start. Hang on, I'll just turn myself off. Okay. It's dreadful. My students will enjoy that one. It goes up on the web. Okay, neoclassical theory counts income, it ignores the change in debt. And I've got a simple logical argument about it, which says that all the increased debt does is transfer spending power from somebody who's a saver to somebody who's a borrower. 
and therefore it matters if the saver is really, really different in personality to the borrower, but the aggregate level of debt doesn't really matter. And that's the reason they ignored the theory developed by Michael Irving Fisher. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Would that be true if we had physical money like gold? But it's yes. not true because you can go around and invent money. Yeah, if we had, if we, if we actually tra handed each other slivers of gold to transactions, then the number of slivers of gold would, if you had, if you handed your slivers of gold up to somebody else, then yes, it would be a case your spending power would fall. So essentially, it comes down to: Do banks have any impact on the capitalist system? That's a good question, and that's what I'll come to. Too. So they ignored uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, the first person to make a strong argument that the level of debt what caused the Great Depression was Irving Fisher. Cool. Anybody know the name Fisher? Irving Fisher? Yeah. Poor bastard believed his own theories before the crisis when he was a neoclassical economist. He went bankrupt. He lost roughly $100 million in 2000 terms, uh, 2000 dollar terms. Went bankrupt, avoided bankruptcy because his wife's sister, who was very wealthy, paid out his debts and then forgave those debts on the deathbed and he didn't become homeless because I think it was Columbia University gave him somewhere to live after he lost his house. So for that personal crisis, he flipped from being a neoclassical to somebody who worried about debt. But he was ignored, and this is Bernanke now, talking about why did we ignore Fisher. And he says, well, debt deflation was ignored by the academic community because of the counter-argument that debt deflation represents no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors. Does anybody see a logical flaw there to begin with? When a debt deflation, people go bankrupt, they don't pay their debts. Okay, That alone is enough reason to say, Bernanke, are you really reading carefully? But he then said, unless there's implausibly large differences in spending habits between the two groups, pure redistribution should have no macroeconomic impact. So they ignored Irving Fisher's arguments completely. And that was then, this is Campbell Paul Krugman right now. This is Krugman from a paper written in, uh, in December 2010, across to January, February 2011, uh, saying that uh, the level of debt doesn't matter. And he then says it's a model where the distribution can have an impact, but the actual level of debt doesn't matter. And making exactly the same argument now, the, uh, a blog post a matter of weeks ago, he said that people think that the burden of debt is like when you owe money to somebody else, you've got to... Uh, a servicing cost. He said, that's not true because the burden, he says, debt is made basic money we owe to ourselves. Therefore, it nets out. Therefore, there's no burden of debt as people actually commonly think of, think of it. So, what vision would make sense? Your vision of that before of gold is an accurate one. But that if it was a gold system, they'd be right. So, we don't have a gold system. And this is what they think actually happens in banking. They believe that here's a bank sitting between a very patient person with lots of money and a very impatient person with no money. And what the bank does is transfer money out of the patient person's pocket into the impatient person's. And therefore, the patient person's spending power goes down, the impatient one rises. Overall, there's no change in aggregate demand. So you can ignore both the level of debt and the change in debt, and banks are just intermediaries. That's the mental model they have of how banks operate. Trouble is, it's both logically and empirically false. Because, again, with the gold example you gave a while ago, that would be the case. But when you go to a bank, the bank doesn't take money out of somebody else's account who's a saver and give it to you. The bank gives you a loan. And they therefore create money out of nothing, literally by a double entry bookkeeping process. Any accountant would know the idea here. You make an entry in the ledger saying you, you have a million dollars, and you make another entry saying you owe me a million dollars. And that process actually creates spending power. Now, this was argued way, way back in the 1930s by one of the few great economists. There have been a handful that were worth reading. This is Joseph Schumpeter, very much worth reading. And he said that the conventional answer, which is the transfer from patient to impatient borrower, he says, is not obviously absurd. In other words, you might be stupid enough to fall for it. Okay? But he said, the real way of getting spending power is not by transferring existing spending from one person to another, but by the banks creating purchasing power out of nothing. And he said it's simply a case of double entry bookkeeping, they create the spending power that way. And that's the fundamental way that banking has operated for four or five hundred years at least, in uh, an argument much longer than that. Yeah? They're always loaning out fake money, the money that you gave them. Uh, but they're always loaning out fake money, the money you gave them to save is still there. Why do they care about that? Well, that's one reason that banks have to be, that's one reason.
reason the whole idea of what we think is fractional reserve banking actually means the banks pay onto a certain amount of money relative to what depositors actually have in their accounts. So the American rules require American banks above a certain size to have 10% of the money that households have deposited with them in cash. So if they say you have a bank with say a billion dollars in deposits from the household sector, it's required to have a hundred million dollars in cash. And therefore, if a run occurs, it's highly unlikely that 10% of the depositors will turn up asking for their money back. If anything less than 10% do, they've got the money in stock. So they're only loaning out 90% fake money. That's 90% fake money, which is called fractional reserve banking, but that's not actually the technical way in which money is created. But that, there's a model called the money multiplier that argues that what actually happens is governments create money, like say create a hundred million, or create a trillion dollars worth of deficit. We'll say, let's say, say hundred million dollars by running a deficit and give that money to unemployed people. We go to the banks and deposit a hundred million, and the banks hang on to 10%, so they hang 10 million, then they lend 90% out, 90 million dollars. That goes to other banks, and they hang on to 10% of that, 9 million, lend at 81, and by an iterative process, you ultimately have a trillion dollars worth of spending power created out of the $100 million in. That's the conventional model. That's also false. It's not actually how it happens either. But I'll, in my book, I go into the technicals as to why those models are wrong. But the fundamental idea is still that, that, there, that the banks, they are lending out fictional money, if you like. The actual amount of physical money, we're talking gold or notes, is less than 10% of the total money supply. And I think in America's case, it's about 3%. So most money that exists in the system is accounting entries. If you actually wanted to go back to what actually is physically grabbable, like actual banknotes and stuff like that, you'd be down to less than 3% of the money supply. So the real, that we're, back, we're, in a, we're in a world with double entry bookkeeping, yeah. Sorry, is that just a slightly Pardon? aggressive way of approaching it? Yeah, sure. It's not just cash, it's also things like uh, real estate. So if the bank's got, um, a whole bunch of real estate loans that are out in play. Yeah. It's not just, oh, we've only got 10% cash and then everything else is made up. They have 10% cash and then they have a whole bunch of yeah, yeah, but potentially that's less liquid assets. That well, they have assets, assets and liabilities, that's right. And, and if you're therefore, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have a capital system. You've got to have, I'm not, I'm not anti this mechanism yeah. at all, but I'm saying that if you actually wanted to get back to what people think is money in terms of grabbable cash or grabbable gold, it's only sure. a tiny fraction of the total sure. system. assets are the 97 percent. Right. But I actually mentioned assets, it's very important to think of the first three letters of that word. <laughs> Sometimes you can be an ass for believing the valuation that exists. So that, that double entry bookkeeping process is what actually creates money. And what the proper model of money is this, you've got an entrepreneur, hopefully somebody doing something useful like Google rather than the useless like running a subprime loan, goes to a bank with an idea, the bank says it's a great idea, here's a million dollars, and by the way, you owe us a million dollars. So they simultaneously create the money and the debt. And that's the process, the process of money creation. But to put very simply, back in the 1960s, by a research vice president of the Federal Reserve in New York, when he's actually fighting against the monetarist ideas, which were pretty much gold type money notions, he said, this is what actually happens. That in the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and they look for reserves later, which is why the money multiply model is wrong, technically speaking. The, the, the money multiply model says lending starts with reserves and leads back through deposits to loans. And the argument from this guy is to go the opposite direction. Yeah. <coughs> so when you, when you say this, it like I'm a, but I didn't do economics in You're a lucky so. man. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking a minute ago, when they had all those economists in the same room at the same time, that would have been a good time to set off a bomb. What I'm actually thinking now is, if, if you're a bank and you lend to me, and you get a double entry, and you can go off and lend and I spend that, the fact that I can repay my loan is supporting this vast inverted pyramid of debt. Yeah. So if I get into trouble and I cannot pay back, yeah. it's not just me that could potentially get into trouble, right? That's, it's going to shuffle its way through the system. It's a chain reaction, and that's one of the great dangers. Uh, capitalism rests on a rolling set of promises, which will work if most of those things end up being entrepreneurial ideas that generate cash flow that lets you resurface that debt. And that's the good side of capitalism. The dangerous side is when Ponzi schemers 
By the way, who hasn't heard the name Ponzi in this room? Has not. Okay. Five years ago, I'd asked the opposite question and got the same response. Everybody knows what Ponzi is these days. Okay. But Ponzi merchants borrow money to gamble on asset prices. They don't create anything more. They don't add to a capacity of the economy to produce. So they necessarily cause a growth in debt without a growth in income earning capacity. And that's really what causes our crises. That's, that's the main thing I'm both trying to model and also attack so that we can finally, hopefully, eliminate that part of that bad aspect of capitalism from the system. But that's the point of view. The rolling promises will work, generally speaking, if most of what's funded is entrepreneurial activity and if a fair number of those lead to you know, success stories like Google rather than failures like one of these days, you know, um, you'll get somewhere with capitalism. That'll make me popular in Yahoo, won't it? Sorry about that. Okay. So the new loan puts spending power into, into, into existence. That comes back to the punchline versus the neoclassicals. The growth in debt is a contributed aggregate demand. And that's where their theory goes wrong, and what I'm trying to do is build a theory which takes this into account properly. So aggregate demand in the capitalist economy exceeds income when debt is growing. And therefore, the neoclassicals are wrong to ignore the change in debt, and that's why they didn't see this crisis happening. So I'm starting from the position of saying aggregate demand in the capitalist economy is income plus the change in debt. And that is then spent on three different things. With income, you mainly have to pay the consumption, Part of the change in debt finance is what I think is positive in capitalism, which is investment, innovation, technology, etc., etc. Uh, part of it also finances speculation, gambling, and asset prices. And that's the part that brings us unstuck. So you then buy goods and services, but you also buy financial claims. You buy shares and you buy property, which is a financial claim on land. And I'm calling the latter bit net asset turnover, because of course we don't buy and sell every last asset every year only a fraction of assets are sold. But it seems like you know, buying shares or buying, buying housing. And you can, break it, you can break the net asset sales into three parts. The price of the assets, so the Dow Jones or the Case-Shiller Index or the price of, uh, of BHP shares, times the quantity of shares that exist, times the proportion of turnover annually, which in shares is no more than 5 or 10%, housing a lot less than 10%. So what you get is an aggregate balance in a capitalist economy is that aggregate demand it's not aggregate supply, it's aggregate supply plus the change in debt, and it's then spent buying goods and services and net claims on financial assets. So the accounting balance is this, the change in, when you then look at the change in, in how does aggregate demand grow? Well, it's growing income, the change in income, plus the acceleration of debt. And that's the key important point. The, the demand itself being income plus the change in debt, change in demand is a change in income plus the second derivative of debt. Now that then means you've got a relationship between um, change, because the change in aggregate, change in debt finances the current price level of assets, the acceleration of debt determines which direction asset prices are going to go in. So you've got a relationship between acceleration of debt and changing asset prices. And that's why bubbles always burst. So, the basic logic of mathematics, and I know I can get away with it in the Google assembly, is to say that income plus the change in debt is GDP plus net asset turnover, where I can break that down into price of assets times the quantity times the turnover percentage. And therefore, the second, taking the first derivative of that, the change in GDP plus the acceleration of debt will be equal to the change in GDP plus the derivative of the net asset turnover. So you've got a relationship that says that acceleration of debt is what drives change in asset prices and also drives change in economic activity. So we've got a link between acceleration of debt and change in economic activity and that's why we have such volatility in capitalism. Because for a start, you can't have acceleration being positive forever. Okay? At some point, acceleration has to go negative. At the very best, it becomes zero and therefore bubbles have to burst. For the same reason you can't drive a car at infinite speed, you can't have infinitely growing debt, the acceleration has to turn around. So if you take a look at the economy from that point of view, you can understand why this crash happened. If they're looking for 1993 to 2007, there's a boom. 2007 08, there's a crash, and the asset markets crashed as well. Let's take a bit of a look at it graphically. This chart, the red line here shows GDP, the blue line is GDP plus the change in debt. And as you can see, the 
change in debt at one stage was adding $4 trillion to aggregate demand in a $14 trillion economy. That's how big the change in debt was. Then when the negative hit, it's subtracting $2.5 trillion from aggregate demand. So you went from an 18.3 to an 11.5 trillion economy in two years. That's why it was such a huge slump. And that's what the neoclassical economists are still ignoring. The government partly rescued, you don't have the government in there as well, but the government also creates money by running a deficit or by open market by operation for the Federal Reserve. So rather than being at the scale I showed you beforehand, it was 18.7 to 13 trillion dollars. That's still a hell of a town term. And if you didn't have the government spending, the deficit spending is still going on today, aggregate demand would be a trillion dollars lower, and you'd be, have, you'd be 300 billion dollars below GDP even now. So the whole debate about getting back to a surplus, I think, is actually setting us up for another crisis, another crunch. If the American government could actually do that, they'd cause another downturn once they did it. So the obsession that politicians have with government debt comes from following the advice of economists, but it's ignoring both the scale and the importance of private debt. So as this crisis has gone on, government debt's gone up by 30% of GDP, but the fall in private debt's 47%. So the fall in government, the rise in government debt, was more than counteracted by the fall in private. And that's this is the looking back at the 1920s now. Again, how could you ignore this when they've got data that shows them this is what happened during the last Great Depression. So it's obvious empirically there's something to look at there. But the neoclassical still managed not to look at it and obsess on the wrong thing. So now to take a look at how the change in debt correlates with unemployment. This is I've turned unemployment upside down and graphed it on the right hand scale. So it's zero unemployment up here, twelve percent down here. That's the blue line. The red is the change in debt. And because there's such a heavy level of debt financing in the American economy now, and most of the OECD, that's why you get that insanely high correlation coefficient there, minus 0.92 between the two. The same thing applies, now I'm taking a look at the second derivative, I'm looking at the acceleration of debt versus change in employment. This is the second derivative in economic data correlated with the first derivative. And the correlation still comes out at minus 0.74 over a 20 year period through boom and bust. So the empirical data is incredibly strong supporting the argument you've got to look at the change in debt to understand why this crisis is coming, why this crisis has happened. And you'll notice also there's a bit of a recovery going on in the unemployment at the moment. That's also turned, a dramatic turnaround in the acceleration of debt. It went from massively negative when the crisis first hit back to massively positive. So the normal range for the acceleration in debt was between minus 5 and plus 10. All the way back, I can take it back to the 1950s and there's nothing anywhere outside that range. Then you hit what happened during the Great Recession, minus 26% downturn. Then just the simple slowdown in the rate of decline of debt meant it accelerated at a rate that's never accelerated that before either. So the volatility of debt is driving the current economic cycle as well. So the previous one, you know, from the previous slide, asset prices, so even working at a very aggregated level and not looking at links between change in debt and income itself, if you actually expand out the chain rule there, you've got five terms on the right hand side. If I got 1.00 correlation between the two, I'd be fine. So it's not going to be perfect. But of course, that you can correlate with the crisis of the, the busting of the NASDAQ bubble. Hmm. I was just wondering if you had some theory as to why it didn't correlate. Yeah, it's a long debt split that the debt change, right? If you actually look back to the data, what you'll find is there's only a very small deceleration going on there, but a huge shock in various parts of the economy when their telecommunications crashes, Yahoo crashes, and so on. Excuse me? Yeah. Uh, two quick questions about that graph. Has yeah. the unemployment definition been the same over the 
No, good question. Unemployment has been redefined about 15 times. Strangely enough, every one of the 15 redefinitions reduced the level of unemployment. Isn't that mysterious? Uh, the, the most recent redefinition is now in the Zillow, they call the U3 level and the U6. They publish the U3 and the U6, but the U3 is the one they report. U3 defines you as being unemployed if you've been out of work for less than a year. So one way to have the unemployment rate to a fall is people will be unemployed for more than a year. And they then drop into the U6 level where they're still counted, but only if they're unemployed for less than two years. There's a huge level of, of, of people who aren't properly recorded in the data anymore, and it'd be more reliable, and I will for this when I work on the next book, to work in terms of the fraction of the workforce that actually has a job, which has gone down quite drastically over time. So there's lots and lots of fudging of this data, with nothing like scientific data, unfortunately. Sorry, there's one follow-up question. Is, um, is there a useful legal lag in those two but, indicators, or is there a useful legal lag? The, the lags change around a bit, because again, what I'm looking at, when I say income plus the change in debt gives you aggregate demand, <coughs> effectively I'm ignoring whether there's any relationship between income and the change in debt. But of course, there's a feedback because a part of that change in debt then finances investment. And the investment is part of how the economy grows. And you've got a, a quick cumulative feedback loop going on there. So when I'm, when I'm using this uh, GDP plus the change in debt, it's a simple shorthand for what is a quite a complex dynamic model. And sometimes you'll have leads, other times you'll have lags. I'm going to show you asset prices now, for example. And clearly, one thing which encourages people to take out more debt. Like you might go, I'll get a margin loan because house asset prices are rising. So that the change in debt and change in asset prices can inspire you to borrow more money. But equally, because you borrow more money, you cause the asset prices to rise. So it's a, it's a circular loop. You do get very, the, generally speaking, the change in debt does lead the asset prices and unemployment, but sometimes the lags shift quite radically. My main thing is dynamic modeling, by the way, rather than being a statistician. I was forced into this because uh, I was the only one doing it, fundamentally. This is now looking at share price changes. Now, the possibility of finding any correlation at all between annual data in change of debt and annual data in, in an, asset, an asset price as volatile as Dow Jones, I didn't think was all that high, but I still find a correlation there at 0.24. And you can see that, generally speaking, when the change in debt is above zero, or if the acceleration debt is positive, pardon me, you're going to get, generally speaking, booming share prices. And you can see the negative here. Again, you can see the correlation there, the turnaround in the Dow Jones, precedes the turnaround in the credit acceleration. I'm still working on a decent definition of the debt acceleration, by the way, uh, because I'm using monthly data, and I'm, I'm taking change over a year because it's just such volatile monthly data. But things like fast Fourier transforms of the data doing filtering processes and so on might give me a far better definition than what I'm using right here. But even with that imperfect measure, what I'm doing to get the acceleration in debt, I'm taking a change in the change in debt over a year divided by the GDP at the midpoint of that year. Pretty rough definition, yeah. So what do you think is the cause of the changes in the uh, debt acceleration? So what is driving the changes? In debt? Yeah. Fundamentally what drives the change in debt is banks make money by creating debt. The source of bank profitability, the finance sectors, comes from creating debt. And therefore, they are going to try to find any reason to make us borrow money. Because the more we borrow, the more they, they can make money on the spread between interest rates on the amount of debt outstanding. But, if, but people have to borrow. So yeah, yeah. Banks can do what they want, right? Well, the simple, simple reason, just imagine you're going to the dentist and you have a sore tooth. Would you like to get more than one tooth full? Of course not, okay? What if the dentist persuades you to look sexier with less teeth? That's what banks have done with debt. They've persuaded you to look, you, they've made debt sexy by saying, yes, debt's bad, but if you take out a levered position and asset prices, they say you borrow, a, 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 you take out a margin loan, you put down 10% of the share price and you buy shares. If they go up by 10%, you double your money. They make being in debt sexy. They say, well, yeah, okay, it'll all be disastrous if the asset, if the house has to prices go down, but they always go up. So it's a way to easy money. I'll give you an empirical, but that sounds a bit flippant, I know, but I'll give you an empirical basis for that. If you look at the level of household debt in Australia, back in 1990, the ratio of unsecured uh, uh, yeah, credit cards, car loans, that sort of thing, was 10% of GDP. 20 years later, it's 10% of GDP. It's moved up and down in the meantime, but it's still about the same level. 
mortgage debt in 1990 was 17% of GDP, it peaked at 89%. So people didn't borrow to buy plasma TVs and stuff like that, even though we make that you know, comment about what people do with their credit cards. They borrowed to gamble on rising asset prices. So I fundamentally think the finance sector, periodically, after a crisis like the Great Depression, the one we're in now, falls into persuading us to get into borrowing money again to gamble on rising asset prices. But the process of rising debt actually causes the asset price. We get caught in a positive feedback loop. Well, what stops the loop? get to the stage where people learn to you, what stops the loop is if people are going get to continue accelerating. That's why that, that acceleration loop matters so much because with, with positive acceleration needed to keep asset prices rising, you have to maintain, generally speaking, positive acceleration for debt indefinitely. Of course you can't do that with the sub stage you are with thousand percent of your income. So at some point for that very reason it must slow down and it must break. Uh, yeah. Oh, you sure he's had a few guys <laughs> Right. Um, I was just wondering, um, talking about um, banks, uh, banks profiting from debt yeah. um, and then driving demand, does the um, banking sector's use of service-based fees as a profit-making thing that balances their debt effect in different, um, in different countries, how this happens? Like the Australian banks make a, a large portion of money out of service-based fees as well as... Um, yeah, they've found all sorts of ways to charge extra money on, on us. Um, but at the same time as they're doing that, they're also reducing the margin between deposit rates and loan rates. So I, I think they've found fees to be a more reliable income flow than the margin between the two. Uh, they've compensated for a declining margin for rising competition by adding service charges and stuff like that. But fundamentally, they can only make the service charges at the level of debt rose as well. They're both linked to the level of debt. Yeah. So it seems axiomatic to me that the banks are going to lend to you if they think there's a realistic chance of getting the money back. Yeah. So I read in, in the US and, um, for example, the UK, that banks aren't lending to small businesses. Yep. Despite the fact they seem to have plenty of money. Would that stop this, or do you think that will come to Australia? Oh, it's coming to us now. There's actually an article in today's Herald saying that banks are probably not going to be lending to mortgages anymore because given the increase in the wholesale funding costs, they're now making, they're making losses on recent mortgages. They're coming saying the last four months of mortgages were probably uh, loss makers for the banks. So at some stage, they're going, to, they're going to refuse to lend. And we go through this bizarre cycle where rising levels of debt cause a bubble and a boom. Then get to a massive level of debt which can't be serviced anymore. And at that stage, the banks stop lending, which causes a crunch. It's an insane, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like a totally out of control loop in an electronic circuit. An electrician would say, we've got to damp that loop. And that's what I'm trying to, to argue for. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a very bad hearing to speak about. Given the exposure of uh, debt for residential property, yeah. thus ultimately increasing the, ex the bank's balance sheet with residential property, yeah. if things do turn, doesn't that make them more exposed to the downturn? Very yes. much so. I mean, Australian, yeah. banks have got a, Australian banks have a high level of exposure to mortgage debt than American banks had at the peak of their prices. They didn't have that before the, what I call the first time vendors boost came out when Rudd you know, double and treble the ground the first home buyers. But after that, the bank's level of total, uh, level of, of mortgage debt as an asset on the bank's books exceeded the ratio in the American banking sector at the start of their crisis. So they are vulnerable, yeah. What do you see happening to the housing market over the next two years? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in print on this one. I said it'll be down between six and 10% over this calendar year. And uh, I, I certainly expect over between when I first got caught in an ambush of a bet, which the way I defined the bet would have been a 20% fall over a five year period between October 2008 and, uh, well, November 2008 and October 2013. So I quick to see a house price fall of that order, but not stopping at 20%. I've always said I thought house prices would fall of the magnitude of the Japanese fall, which is 40% over 10 to 15 years. In fact, the Japanese market has fallen 68%, I think, over 18 years. So it's going to keep falling. Pardon? It's going to keep falling in experience. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. And you can quote, yeah. In, in the past, you have mentioned different times when you think the bubble actually started. So you mentioned 1964, 1983, 1988. So what's your date for when the bubble is going to come? The bubble, I dated the bubble in Australia in 1990. There's two bubbles in Australia. The first one began in 1988 housing, 
It then was slightly deflated with the recession of the 1993 period, and it restarted in 1997. I've actually got a, on my website, I had a study called The Hand of Gov, which is a long document on, on residential real estate. And if anyone wants to give me a chance to finish the presentation here, I might go to that one. And that's, so I'll give it to Carson. Anybody wants to look through quite a detailed study of the housing market where I think it's going, that's probably the best way to do that. If I can dive on a bit, possible? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, here we go, housing. Can't get away from it. This is looking at the acceleration of mortgage debt in America to the change in house prices in America. Now, of course, as I mentioned the point, I mentioned the poor correlation beforehand. Uh, mortgage debt clearly is much more correlated with the housing asset. So if you take a look at the acceleration of mortgage debt in America and correlate that to change in house prices, you get a correlation coefficient of 0.79. And that's over a 20 year period from 1990 through to 2012. So that's pretty potent to show what really gives you a house bubble is accelerating debt and therefore it has to burst. So that's the facts. Back to the theory. Another reason the Aircastle didn't see it coming, they commit uh, what I'd call the fallacy of, of emergent properties. They believe they can model the entire economy as a single consumer, consuming a single good produced in a single factory, which the single consumer <coughs> is the only worker in and, the, and, and also the only capitalist, and can foresee the future, blah, 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 blah. And if you think I'm being a, a, right, a left-wing critic of neoclassical economics, I'm quoting Robert Solow here, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics summarizing the model that dominates macroeconomic theory today. He says, preferred model has a single agent optimizing over infinite time with perfect foresight in an environment that realizes the plans more or less flawlessly through perfectly competitive markets of goods and labor and perfectly flexible prices and wages. And he then says quite sensibly, how could anyone expect a sensible short to medium macroeconomics to come out of that setup? This is a Nobel Prize winner criticizing theory from the inside. So I'm not the only one by far trying to get rid of this nonsense in economic theory. This is no, it's no wonder they didn't see the crisis coming to that delusion of how they thought the economy operated. So I'm trying to build a monetary macroeconomics based in disequilibrium and dynamics rather than equilibrium and statics, with social classes rather than isolated agents, with money not data, and the foundations have got nothing to do with conventional theory. It all comes from the ignored uh, geniuses of economics, including Marx, got a lot of things wrong, but not everything. Schumpeter, Schraffer, Keynes, Fisher's in there, Koleski, Minsky, Goodwin, and a guy called Graziani. Uh, and I've, it's all put together effectively in Minsky's what's called financial instability hypothesis. Has anybody here heard, heard of Mohamed Minsky? Quite a few. He was totally unknown outside economic circles. So actually, I applied non orthodox economics many, many years ago. But he made the case that unless your model can generate a Great Depression, it's not a model of capitalism. You put it in this beautiful way, saying that can it, the Great Depression, happen again? Writing back in 1980, 82, said, if, and if it can happen, why hadn't it happened until 1982? And he said, those are obvious questions that arise from the historical record. He said, to answer the question, you must have a theory that can generate a depression in one of its possible states. And for that reason, he rejected neoclassical economics because it can't generate a depression unless it presumes the country, the world gets hit by a meteor. So he called it this financial instability hypothesis. And I'm actually realizing I'm running really badly out of time here. We've got to finish about in, in 10 minutes' time. Is that right, Carson? I'll probably go a little bit over. Can you handle it only about 10 minutes longer? Yeah. Okay. So the theory goes that there's, t you take the economy in historical time, and being in historical time, there's some debt induced recession everybody remembers in the past. And if you take the economy shortly after that crisis is been recovered from, everyone is conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on. And therefore, only conservatively estimated projects get funding. But because the economy is recovered, most of those projects succeed. And because they succeed, people revise their risk premium and think, oh, we were too conservative. If we'd been more highly levered, we would have made more money. So what you get is a positive feedback process that means that stable conditions lead to rising expectations. A period of tranquility causes expectations to rise, more debt to be taken on, and that gives you a boom for a while as people borrow more money and invest more heavily and so on. So the expand, economy expands and that validates some of those risks. But ultimately you get what Missy calls the euphoric economy of buying, where the money supply is growing, you can gamble on asset prices and make money out of that as I've shown a while ago. Ponzi financiers turn up, 
who make money by buying and selling assets in a rising market, but their cash flow from those assets is less than their debt servicing costs. So they're incredibly vulnerable to a downturn. Ultimately, a lot of those projects fail. Interest rates are driven up as well by the competitive process. Finally, the bubble bursts, just with the slowing down of the rate of growth of debt, as I showed you earlier. Non-Ponzi investors sell their assets to get out of trouble. The asset market collapses, and you're back where you started again. The boom turns to bust. And that cycle repeats, but each time it happens, you'll start the cycle again from a high level of debt. People will get a new level of debt more easily. Once the recovery strikes, they don't get quite back down to the so low level of debt as before. So you get a, a, a ratcheting up of debt over time. And that's what causes an overall crisis. Now, I've modeled that many, many years ago with a simple model that says, just they take a, the standard, uh, this is a simple cyclical model of the economy. Again, the cyclical models exist, but neoclassical economists don't work with them. This says capital determines the level of output. Output determines employment. That determines the rate of employment divided by the population. That will then give you the rate of change of wages. Integrate the rate of change of wages, and you'll get the wage level. Multiply that by the level of employment, you get the wage bill. Subtract that from output, you get profit. In this simple model, all profit is invested. Investment's the rate of change of capital stock. Integrate that, and you get back where you started again. You've got a closed deterministic cycle. And when you simulate this, what you get is a cyclical system. The equilibrium is unstable. Those who know their eigenvalues, the dominant eigenvalues, have real part zero in this simple model. So I've taken that model and added in that debt exists, and capitalists actually borrow money during a boom and have to repay it during a slump. And again, this is empirically supported. So I simply say the rate of change of debt is investment minus profits, and they feed that into the model. And what I get is a system that behaves this way. That's the mathematics of it, for those who are uh, mathematics supposed to turn up there and didn't. What you get is a system where if you're close to equilibrium, it'll converge, which is what's happening on the left-hand side. But if you're far from equilibrium, you get divergent cycles. And what's driving that divergent cycle is an enormous level of debt. The blue line is a stable system where debt actually declines over time. The, the red line, pardon me. The blue is cycles of debt in the, in the model leading to a breakdown. And what I'm now doing is extending that model to be a monetary model. So that was actually like implicit money. I had debt inside the system, but not actually money in a strict sense. I've since worked out a way to model money properly. Believe it or not, I'm probably the first economist to have money as an inherent part of a macroeconomic model. And the basic idea is that you input financial relationships in a table like this, double entry bookkeeping, for those who know the accounting. And then symbolically add up the columns and what I get is a system of differential equations describing the financial dynamics. I then attach that to a physical model of the economy. And what I get very quickly, I'm waiting for the, here we go. That's, well, that's a system in equations. I've, I've, I've punched past the equation rather too rapidly there. What it generates is a model that behaves this way. This is the actual data smooth data of employment, inflation, and debt to GDP ratio for the American economy. I haven't attempted yet to fit the, my model to that data, but this is a simulation run in my model. And qualitatively, I think I've got the behavior there. Now that's, that's the start of doing, this is something that I can do, and it's you know differential equations, uh, heavy duty stuff for economists who don't even learn that in their training, strangely enough. Uh, shouldn't be heavier for you guys. But I've since worked out ways also of extending it to multiple sectors. That had the fiction of a single commodity economy. Of course, we all live in a multiple commodity economy. So I've worked out a way of doing that as well. And rather than having a single sector and a single commodity, I'm modeling, in this case, four sectors, uh, four different uh, loan accounts. And that monster system there ends up with the capacity to generate the, multi the cycle that we see in the real economy in multiple sectors. So I've now got cycles in profitability in four different sectors, cycles in uh, employment and, uh, oh, sorry, in GDP and level of debt, and income distribution cycles and so on. I'm just waiting for the keyboard to react here. So 
you can actually build a monetary model of capitalism. It's not impossible, but at the moment it's dense, so you've got to work in differential equations. So what I'm working on as well now is a way of making this viable to drag economists away from this nonsense of comparative statics they're still doing. This is Paul Krugman defending himself of being attacked by another academic in the New York Times talking about how comparative statics uh, is a necessary tool of economics. Comparative statics is the problem. The fact they think they can compare one equilibrium position to another equilibrium position assumes the economy moves from one equilibrium to another. We live in a complex system and moves from one disequilibrium to another. So we need to have dynamic modeling. And that's what I'm trying to work uh, a, way of, a way of doing. And the economists could use tools like this. This is VizSim. Anybody know systems dynamics? Simulink, that sort of thing? Yeah, the question or is this a statement? <laughs> okay, okay. This, this is modeling a financial system in VizSim, which is a proto program like Simulink for modeling engineering systems. And it took a week or two, you could work out what are the all relations mean here. But that's ex this is exactly the same model in bookkeeping format. It looks like this. And I can explain the bookkeeping, and if I had two more minutes, I'd explain the, the flows there. It's quite simple to understand those flows in a bookkeeping framework. It's very difficult to read it in a flow chart. So what I'm working on with the help of the Institute for New Economic uh, Thinking is a program called Minsky that combines the two. It melds the flow charting dynamics for physical flows with the tabular uh, display for uh, doing financial flows. Now, we've got it to the prototype stage. This is just showing that same model I showed you a moment ago, uh, the, the cyclical Goodwin model done in this program. And we're using Tickle TK at the moment. It's still very, very early coding. And that's the tabular style as well. So I've got that far. And my ambition is to turn this into something as sexy as VizSim or Simulink and make it something that's so seductive to students they won't even consider comparative states anymore. That's the ambition. There are a couple of problems. And I'll get onto those in a moment. Um, of course, I've, it's actually advantages, first of all. That's showing you a single, a single banking sector with a single commodity economy. But I've, I used to work in online analytic pro, uh, pro processing databases. So the idea of multi-dimensional tables made eminent sense to me. So you can actually take that flat table and turn it into a hypercube. And in one direction, the hypercube gives you multiple sectors. Twist it the other way, it gives you multiple banks. And have multiple cubes, and you've got multiple national economies. So it's potential to make this an equivalent of how meteorologists model the weather for economic. That's where I want to take it. But there's only one little problem at the moment. <laughs> we need help. Several reasons. The worst of the lot is that I started doing this with a grant from the Institute for New Economic Thinking about about uh, four months ago. So I've got a, a, co a professional colleague of mine, Dr. Russell Standish, who was professor of applied mathematics at New South Uni, used to run their high performance computing unit. Thank God Russell was free. I'm hiring him as my sole programmer right now with this grant of $128,000. With other money, I've been keeping going for roughly a year. Uh, but it doesn't get paid as much as you guys in this room do. But the grant runs out in July, but that wasn't a problem because I was going to apply for a grant for the Australian Research Council, a linkage grant, for about half a million, and that would have kicked in about August, so everything would have been absolutely great. And INET has given me a second grant as part of this linkage grant. I need to have industry partners to do it. All looking wonderful until about two weeks ago. Because last year there were two rounds, one in May, one in November. I could have expected funding in August from the first round. And in January the 10th this year, the AIC said there's going to be one round in November, and the first money will become available in July of 2013, one year after I ran out of money to pay Russell. So I'm being quite blatant here. I need money to keep a single programmer going. I'm going to be doing it, I'm going to appeal. If Google had any cash, I'd take it. If you guys put money into Kickstarter, we're going to have a Kickstarter blog up shortly that you can donate money that way to keep it going. If you want to have something with free programming time, I'd love to have programming systems as well. It's being done under the GPL system. INET will give us another $40,000 this year if we can get matching grants from other people in the public, so we can power it up that way. But certainly there's a coding project out there which we'd love to have help if you have any time and you'd like to have a try at it. Uh, both, both types of systems be greatly appreciated. And while you're doing it, the economy is likely to keep going down the gurgler for the next 20 years and make that 15. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
only way basically you can prevent speculation by that than they're being investment. Yeah, I think you have to, you can't prevent speculation by controlling the bankers. Okay? Because the bankers have got an innate reason why it's in their interest to create more debt. So I don't think there's any possibility of stopping it at the banker side. But to actually, your question earlier is relevant here. To actually have a loan, not just, do banks don't have to be willing to extend the loan, borrowers have to be willing to take that loan on. And the reason we do it right now, if you imagine the two of you are in competition over a particular house, you both earning exactly the same income, you both save just as much. If you can get a 96% loan from the bank and you can only get a 95% loan, loan from the bank, you'll get the house. So you have a positive encouragement to want to have a higher loan to valuation ratio to compete with each other. But my idea there is to say that we should be, you stop the banks lending on the basis of the income of the borrower. We should limit the maximum amount of money that a bank can lend to finance a house purchase on the income the house itself can earn. With most houses, you either rent the house out or you can calculate an imputed rent for owner occupiers. So on my magic number there would be, say, 10 times. So the house was uh, renting for, say, $1,000 a week, then the maximum anybody could borrow to buy that house from the bank would be $520,000. And that would matter. You, therefore, if you two are competing for that house, one of you would need to save more money. So rather than having a positive feedback loop between the level of gearing and house price, you'd have a negative feedback loop. So that's one way of control it. And the other, yeah? What you still end up with boom bus cycles with the standard and smaller one? Uh, much, much smaller, because there's no encouragement to borrow money. To, to, you, you can't borrow money to make the house prices rise. If the house prices would go up, that means leverage has gone down. It gives you a negative leverage, but it's apparently a positive one. The other one I'll come to in a sec. The other idea is with shares at the moment. Hey, if you, did you all get shares in, a Jeep, in an IPO for Google, or have you bought shares of the company at various times? Okay. When you buy money in an IPO, you, you give the money to the company. And I'm, completely in favour of that. But when you borrow, when you gamble on Google share price on the stock market, you're giving another speculator money. Okay. So I, what I'm <coughs> going to do is enhance the primary share issue market and reduce the appeal of the secondary market where most of the leverage actually occurs. So the idea I have there is that shares would continue on as they are now if you buy them from an IPO. They, any share you have now would last forever. But after it's sold a, a defined number of times, say one or two times, which enables initial purchases to sell them for a capital gain. After they're sold no, no, no more than a, you know, a handful of times, they become what are called jubilee shares and they expire after 50 years. And the idea would be you'd be an idiot to borrow money to buy a jubilee share. The only money you, you shares you want to borrow buy with borrowed money would be an initial public offering or a share from somebody who is, you know, selling one of the, their first couple of times. So I'm going to reduce the level of borrowed money in stock markets. So those are the two issues I've got that I hope would stop not the banker's behaviour but the borrower's behaviour. Yeah. So your example with the house price, you can only but your example with the house price where you could only borrow an amount which was a multiplier of how much the house would get in the market to rent. Yeah. So recently in Sydney, rents on property have gone right up. Mm. So would that not then lead the fact that you could then borrow more money on the house? So then people would be priced out of the market, they couldn't afford to buy, so they have to uh, rent. And that would then cause the rents to go up further. Yeah, but there's still a link. The, the, the fundamental thing is I want to have a link between the level of debt and income. Because if you, have a, if you break that link between, you can get a slight bubble coming out of that sort of thing for sure. You wouldn't get rid of bubbles completely. But you get a complete divorce when people to pay no account of the, the, the income earning capacity and simply think they could sell it for twice as much as they paid for it after seven years. So could you not have a system like in the UK where you borrow, say, three times your earnings? Yeah, whereas you were borrowing about eight. Mm. You know, so that, those bubbles only occur because banks can get away with the fiction of saying they're basing it on the income of the borrower. But in fact, they're basing it with the, on the income with a very elastic definition of how much of the income they can take. And what the Australian banks have done is says, the way that they, they're given loans out, they say that if you, the amount of money you have left over after paying the mortgage is above the poverty line, if interest rates are 2% higher than they are now, you can afford a loan, which means about 30% of people that took out mortgages took them out at the bottom of the interest rate cycle two or three years ago. So given the fact that rates have risen that much in the meantime, 30% of borrowers are below the poverty line, which means, I call it, you know, what we had is palaces for the poor. You borrow all this money and you end up in debt and you can't afford to consume. 
which is why we're having a consumption slump in this country. Yeah. Um, we actually had another speaker in here a week ago who was randomly here to talk to us about our own personal financial choices. Um, yeah. And he said that his company thought that the only thing that would change house prices was access to debt and that demographics, immigration, wage levels had nothing to do with it. Would you broadly agree with Broadly, that? I agree, yeah. So, just out of interest, is there some point, like for example, this room, I think most of the people in this room could go out and probably get some kind of a loan now to buy a house. Yep. If like only 90% of the people in this room could do that, would that be a tipping point or only 80% or are you prepared to take a gamble on how many people? Well, it comes down to the, the age at which you can afford to, if you have rising house prices, obviously you cut off the demographic that can actually afford to get, enter into the market to begin with. And I think we probably passed the point of no return with that about six or seven years ago because we're now seeing our first home buyers being aged in their mid 30s and early 40s. And that's the same, first home buyers should be in their mid 20s to late 20s. So it was a sign of how far we've pushed the price barrier up that you've got to be that much older to even consider entering it in the first instance. So yeah, the, the argument is about population. You'll see other stuff saying it's supply and demand, and population pressure that causes house prices to rise. When you look at the rate of change of housing versus the rate of change of population, you'll find that if that argument were correct, house prices should have been falling up until 2006 and risen between 2006 and 2010 because only for that period did the rate of growth of population exceed the rate of growth of houses. So there's plenty of nice, convincing little stories that suck you into a Ponzi scheme, but they're only superficially true. Back actually old Charles Ponzi had a story like that. He reckoned he could make a fortune by buying international postage stamps in one country and sending them to another and making a profit on the arbitrage. But the total volume of, share of, of, of uh, stamps doing that was about $100,000. He sold $10 million worth of them. Yeah. So just look at the, the kind of reaction you're getting today compared to what you got a year ago. I think there's, a, a, there's definitely a change in the, in the mood of the room. There is, yeah. Do you think that's in general whenever you go to... I am, I am finding it much more so overseas than Australia. I, I was in... Um, Europe to launch the second edition of Debunking Economics, which I'm willing to blog over here with a copy. Uh, uh, and for the, for, no, I went to Ireland beforehand and, and by invitation, spoke at a conservative think tank there, and one question they asked me was that, but not just a question of how do you stop this happening again, but how do you cure the current problem? And I stuck my neck out and I put forward a claim that I thought I wouldn't get a chance to express for two or three years of the idea of a modern debt jubilee saying we have to find a way of reducing the debt level drastically now in a way that doesn't disadvantage people who have also been sold bonds by banks who would suffer if we actually just wrote the debt off completely. And I expect to get now shouted down and everybody seriously considered it when we back there to talk about how to do it. Unemployment in the island is 14%. That's the reported level. God knows how high the actual level is. So I'm getting a very positive reception for that sort of stuff in Europe. And even in Australia now I'm finding but that is turning. It is quite intriguing. It's going to be a business review weekly story on me in a couple of weeks' time, I think. Uh, that wouldn't have happened two years ago. Yeah. So, Financial currently, one of your main complaints about mainstream economics is yeah. that they have to keep the resilience and then the causes yeah. prices. But you are not saying that it should be three times uh, income limit on borrowing, it should be that. I'm doing exactly arguing for exogenous speaks to what it's doing and doesn't stop. Well, I, you, you certainly have. Um, if you have an endogenous feedback loop that you know generates part of your instability, part of what I'm trying to do is to reduce the impact of that feedback loop. So, and that requires a, a, a government rule to do it. So you can see that as endogenous in one sense. But I don't see, see it's endogenous meaning market, endogenous meaning government, because fundamentally the government sector is part of the overall system. And there has never been a market economy without legal rules to define how the market behaves. So exogenous shock from the air classicals means things like underwater volcanoes causing carbon dioxide levels to rise, uh, or meteor strikes from Mars. They, they, they don't, uh, their definition of exogenous is very shonky. Uh, I, I, I see a need to redefine the legal framework for capitalism. And you can see that as being exogenous, but I'm saying, well, let's redefine the actual system we live in. I 
get them to spend money right now. Sorry. Um, one result of the Jubilee shares, um, I think, would force companies to have dividends. Companies to? Who, who don't pay a dividend, it would force them. Yeah. They'd also force companies to pay dividends. Yeah. Yeah. Because look, you look at Microsoft and look at uh, Berkshire Hathaway right now, their share prices appreciate all the time because they don't pay dividends out. So if you actually did <laughs> or Google, you actually force them to pay dividends. And I think that's actually sensible. Microsoft do pay dividends. Do they? Yes, they do. Okay. Since, yeah. since Bill Gates left, because he was only a form of income. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, that, that, if you actually, uh, one chart I can, I can send over to Carlson, you might find quite intriguing, is deflating the Dow Jones by the CPI. And if you take a look at that, you can see the peaks in 1929, 1966, strangely enough, and right now, the peak, the peak in 2000 is off the scale compared to the other peaks. But there's still, even, even though there's a bit of a trend built in by the fact that companies like that don't, don't pay dividends, therefore their share price should appreciate, <coughs> overall there's almost no trend. And in house prices, there is no trend over the long term. So the bubbles we're living in now truly are bubbles. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about not being able to successfully regulate banks because they have inherent motivation. But I was interested um, that there's, yes, we have real money, yes, we have asset money, but can they actually also lend beyond that completely non existent money at like 5 to 1 or 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 or something? Well, if, if, if the level of leverage we got courtesy of CDOs and stuff like that is just unthinkable. Right, so would it not be possible simply to legislate that leverage down and say yeah. banks may not lend more than, say, 5 to 1, then that's it? Yeah, well, there's, like, there's even people like, there's a group called the American Monetary Institute one of several groups around the world, probably the most sophisticated, arguing we should actually abolish the capacity of banks to create money in the first place. One to one. And have, yeah, and have and they call it 100% reserve money. The idea would be the government would spend money into existence through a deficit. The deficit would then uh, fund, be funded through the banking sector. The banks would then have uh, accounts out of which they could lend. When those accounts went down to zero, they couldn't lend anymore. So at the moment, where a bank create, creates money by the double entry of process, what this would be is say, if you have a plus over here, it's got to be negative over there. So that means you, you can't lend more than you've got in your account with the central bank. And I, that system, strictly speaking, technically would work. I have dilemmas about it for a range of reasons, mainly related to not wanting bureaucrats to be deciding how much money is created because I have less space in bureaucrats than I have in bankers. Sure. So, but, but yeah, you could control it by the means like that. The trouble with putting, say, some sort of limit on that is that we used to have those limits back in the 1960s and 1970s, and they failed because they weren't actually the process by which money was created. They'd set targets and always missed the targets. And finally, they abandoned the whole idea of quantitative targeting. So you have to know the dynamic system behind it to begin with. And simple, simple rules like a reserve ratio don't work because, in fact, as Alan Holmes argued, banks don't have to get reserves before they lend. They lend first look for the reserves later. And in the, in the accounting system they had back in the 1960s, the banks had two weeks to find the reserves. So if you actually lend now, create the money now, the money percolates through the system, it is actually in the system two weeks later for you to borrow off other banks if you need to. So it's, it's not a control mechanism. So if you're going to do anything like that, you have to really know the creation process. And that's why I think an AMI type idea is more likely to be effective than saying you can only lend out five times as much and so on. The leverage ones will break down over time. Do you? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I believe what you're saying about the housing market. Uh, should I be like shorting the HP or try and short the banks or something? Uh, even though they can have dividends. I mean, what what would an investor do to take advantage of this? <laughs> <laughs>
He got zero takers. Nobody took him up on it. The thing is, if you go do it the other way, if you actually go for a naked put, so you, you take a put position against the banks, you then run the risk that they might actually get a rally the day before your put you know, is ready to roll and you get wiped out. So the great danger, you can certainly do it, which is taking a real gamble on timing. And the, you know, the, 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 the general trend that, in, if you want to look at where you're likely to find vulnerability, it's going to be the consumer sector in this country because we have a high level of mortgage debt in America and higher interest rates, and that's why, the, why the, all the retailers are suffering. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you mentioned the, kid, you know, the kids who should learn next for the US. Yeah. So do you think in Australia it's possible to come up with something like that given the public data in Australia? Well, you can't. The, the public data in Australia is dreadful compared to the case Shiller data. I don't trust the uh, RP data. I don't trust anybody who makes it. Don't just start if anybody's got a vested interest in data going one way. So RP data will let my list ignore their data series. But the ABS data series is fairly reliable. But it's actually quite a, a simple data series. It's just the median price in each city. Great advantage of the case Schiller index. It's same house sale prices. So it's much, much more reliable. You know, if you're actually saying this house has changed that much in price over time, you've got a quality interest issue as well. There's nothing that good in the Australian data, unfortunately. Yeah. So in, um, in the US and the UK and probably Europe, they're going to have to, they've got this quantitative easing, mm. basically printing money. Mm. There seems to be a bit of a divergence of opinion whether that's going to lead to hyperinflation, or it's not going to do anything, or it's going to cause a further deflation. What's your opinion? I'm in the I'm not going to do anything category, because again, when the, if they did quantitative easing to the public, it could work. Okay? Fundamentally, they're doing quantitative easing and giving it to banks and putting it in the bank's reserve accounts and say, please lend this money. When the bank's thinking, you're joking, why would we lend in this current circumstance? And B, we, nobody wants to borrow from us anyway. So the reserves have gone through the roof and nothing has really happened. There is an argument that it's actually finance commodity price, right, price inflation. I'm not au fait with the argument. I've seen proposition that that's the case. So the banks are effectively, the money's turning up in gambling on commodity prices with, you know, uh, corporate debt trading on, on commodities. So, so maybe finance bubbles in commodity prices, but it's done bugger all for the real economy. If you actually gave it to the public, my, one of my, my different modern debt jubilee is to say, have quantitative of easing for the public, where you give people money through their bank accounts, so if they owe money, then they necessarily have to pay their debt down. If they don't owe money, then they get, an, they get cash, and that will compensate them for the decline in the value of any the loan-based assets they already own. So I, I would, I'm in favour of quantitative easing for the public not for the banking sector. Uh, I've got buckets of that one working for some time, I should think, though. I'm putting out, I'm putting out ideas, but I know I've got no chance of having any, any cadence for five years. So if that idea were to come to pass, yeah. then if you were in net debt to your bank, they would just write some of it off? Yeah, that's right. And if you weren't in net debt, then you would get the equivalent dollars just turn out of them, turn about yeah. Yeah. That's right, and then your, your income earning capacity would, 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 would be the decline. same number of dollars? But would, it, would it be the same number of dollars or would it introduce moral hazard? Well, moral hazard has been with us for so long to even talk about. And the moral hazard is what happened with, uh, with, more, with, gold, uh, with uh, Goldman Sachs and so on. It's overcoming a mistake. And to me, the real moral hazard is letting the financial sector create debt that should never have existed in the first place and then expecting the public to honour that debt. That's the true moral hazard. Which is exactly what happened. Isn't that exactly what happened? It's exactly what happened. So I want to eliminate it. And so if you do it, if you, you do a few modern debt jubilees I'm talking about here, you give the money to the the same quantity of money as you begin to the banks, which and some records is well over fifteen trillion dollars in the American system. It's a gigantic amount of money that's gone through the banking sector. We won't know the actual numbers properly for probably decades. I'll be dead by the time we know how much money was actually given out to the banks in this whole process. But it's not a small amount of money. And therefore, I think it's been wasted fundamentally. And if you gave that to the public and said, if you have debt, you must pay your debt down, but if you don't have debt, you get cash, the banks, of course, would have a, a drop in the value of the loans they've got outstanding, but an increase in their non-income earning assets, so they would get a drastic drop in their income levels. So you directly hit the banks by reducing their income capacity. They wouldn't have a, so they wouldn't be in, insolvent, but they may be illiquid, and that's. That would be a good idea to reduce the cycle of the incomes. If they had to go in receivership, fine, because plenty of them should have been put in receivership for what they've done. But then the public would have, the people who are in debt would have less debt, 
therefore they'd be able to you know, spend more easily out of their incomes than beforehand. The people who own debt through having bought CDOs and all the stuff that had been sold by the banks, all the junk bonds they've sold, would have far less income coming in out of that because the, the debt would be physically reduced in scale, but they'd have a cash stock they could spend out of. So I try to I certainly want to model it carefully before doing anything like this, but to me this attacks the direct cause by reducing the debt level, reducing the income of the banks, and letting us get back to industrial capitalism again, which is where the system actually works. Yeah. Is it part of your idea on Jubilee yeah. debt? mechanism which markets have, which help them fund new projects in capitalism. That's why so I think part of this is going to lower the productivity outcomes <coughs> the worst prices. You, you certainly have lower share prices. I think a large part of share prices really reflects the leverage built into them rather than the actual value of the share. So you have lower share prices definitely. It also we wouldn't make money anywhere near as much out of gambling on the price of second hand shares. But you would make money if you pick a company that is going to be successful in the future. And that's why I want to have capacity for somebody who funds an IPO to be able to sell that share at least once and sell you it. You never sell it again when you bought it at the wrong price. So okay. it doesn't you price discovery mechanisms and loss to give you a IPO. Oh, a that couple of you, 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 I think we can design it in such a way there's still a degree of price discovery. But you don't want to have the whole thing obsessed by price bubbles like the Yahoo price bubble. You know, when you went from one dollar to four hundred back to twenty. And that comes out of the fact that when you have shares lasting indefinitely you can make the argument the share price is going to go to become infinite. It's a bit like the difference between a, you know, a first a, a, a ordinary differential equation and a partial differential equation. I want to have a terminal price as well that stops the price becoming infinite. And if you stop it becoming infinite, then you stop people watching wanting that huge level of gearing, which actually causes the feedback loop. But it's not straightforward, and there are issues with it, but that's the whole objective is to reduce that possibility for positive feedback indefinitely between acceleration of debt and rise in the and share prices. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to go home. So let's, 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 I'm very conscious of Steve's time as well as his voice. So oh, I'm, I'm doing fine. Good. All right. I'm going for a while. So people are welcome to stick around. You're more yeah. than welcome to. Otherwise, this is your yeah. If you do many shares, I mean, people will just create some sort of synthetic product that recreates some sort of... You're going to have to stop the engine. The thing is, when, when a crisis like this happens, the bankers go back into their shells. And I want to make sure they don't generate enough debt for it to get out of them again. My, my father was a banker back in the 50s and 60s in the Commonwealth Bank in Australia. He had the choice of going to the Reserve Bank or the Commonwealth Bank. And he made the case back when they were combined. He said if the governor of the Central the Commonwealth Bank told the bank, commercial bank managers to jump out the window, they'd ask which floor. He said 10 years later they were telling him which floor to jump out of. And they, they were, they're rising, how can they have a rising level of debt? So they can keep the level of debt down. They don't get the power to do that stuff in the first place. And you, therefore, it's not just a case of regulation. It's also an economic theory that directs you towards the correct indicators to look at, one of which is the level of debt to GDP. And past a certain level, you know the bank is getting too powerful, and you've got to come in and intervene and drive that debt level down. So it's not just a case of regulation. It's also awareness about danger signs in the economy. Still not perfect. I'm ne never going to argue for a perfect system. But at least addressing the real causes of problems. Yeah. What's your view on social economics? Because he argues that there's something called social that is the mm -hmm. generator of all the economic that we see. That's a regulation issue. If the social movement is not there, people are not going to be accepted. So in 2000, the glass people were yeah. repealed by the US. Yeah. The social movement said that they wanted to deal with the Yeah. So you could propose everything you wanted, but if the public mood is such that they are not accepted, yeah, uh, so the public mood, to actually put that mood into effect, you've got to have a level of leverage. You have to have the, the financial sector tried to do that back in the 1950s, it would have been laughed out of the court. Yeah, because the public mood then was not receptive. But neither was the level of debt. The, 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 the power of the financial sector depends on the level of debt that's being created. So they can only affect the mood when it creates large amounts of debt to begin with and got us into a Ponzi scheme economy. So social economics is the opposite. So because social mood goes up, well, Robert Pretcher and I, we, 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 we correspond regularly, so I'm quite aware of the, the argument, and it's, it's sensible, I argue, but also tied into the of debt. And Robert agrees with me that that's part of the process. So certainly the social mood does affect it, but to turn that social mood into uh, economic power, you need money. And therefore, if you don't get the level of debt to begin with, you can, you don't, you're not likely to get the level of power you need to do that. 
So if they get if they get if the debt levels rise, they once more, we're cactus. You know, it'll happen again. And my my you know my fear is that it'll be a successor of mine in 2070 that finally gets a successful case where we've got to stop this stuff. Because it's quite possible we could let it all go through and the political reforms don't go that far. And we're back in the same sort of post 1930 situation in five or ten years' time. And then 30, 40, 50 years down the track, the system's back in its normal behaviour and we'll be back to another bubble. I frankly believe global warming will wipe us out before then anyway. But, you know, if we're not for that phenomenon, then we could go through yet another cycle like this as we did in the 1890s and the 1930s. Yeah? I, I was just curious as to your personal opinion about um, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we couldn't see this coming. Oh, we couldn't predict this. And you know how we had no way of knowing this. And then you also hear, oh, this person made like Can, can you buy this right now? Of, like, how much is that? Uh, and then yeah. you hear that like, after a certain point, the banks that were offering the Goldman Sachs, they were all like, started how much? to pay all this cool okay, stuff. So who do I pay? Uh, their own stuff that they'd said. Um, it just yeah. seems just like let me check. Let me check. there are people who know this is going to happen. And there are people who genuinely don't believe that like infinite acceleration is possible, but there's just so much to gain from such a small 